Hello, my name is Justin Bright, and welcome to Kerbal Space Program version 1.8.1 .1 in my Next Small Step RP1 playthrough. So yeah, we kind of left off the last episode in a, well, I don't, wanna really, don't really want to call it a cliffhanger, because I'm not sure it was that, because we all knew where this was going. I launched my Celis uh, 2 rocket out of phase with the moon, and so we were kind of... Like, the moon was 90 degrees off of where I needed it to be to actually make my intercept with the mission that I had, mission trajectory that I had planned. So, we wound up just using all of our Delta V to kind of skim the very top of the sphere of influence of the moon. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to show you the results of that here in a moment and also talk just a tiny bit about the history of the uh, Pioneer 4 mission. Um, but then I will fix my stuff and hopefully get better. And uh, I've, I've got some new rocket designs, not new rocket designs, I've got some new spacecraft designs uh, that will hopefully fix all this and give us a much better shot at the moon. This approximates the historical mission of Pioneer 4, which was launched by a Juno 2 rocket, not by the Thor Able. This was only one of a very few um, successful pro satellite probe launches around this time in the 1958-1959 era. Uh, I actually, we are in March of 1959, which is, oh wow, it's a, <laughs> Pioneer 4 was launched on the 3rd of March, 1959. Wow, how cool is that? We are within, you know, a month of um, actually nailing the historical launch date, uh, which is pretty darn neat if you ask me. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, this is this is pretty close to what that was. It was a spin stabilized, tiny little probe. Uh, I've left um, some extra tankage on here to help um, actually hit our contract for mass because this right here is not a 40 kilogram probe, and the lunar impactor needs to be at least that much. Um, and but that's a good test that this is going to work just fine uh, as our impactor. Uh, all of my calculations were correct as far as the dry mass of this vehicle. The other thing that I really want to test as we get out there is whether my communications work as I was hoping. All right, so nothing left to do except for do a whole bunch of science on the high Earth uh, orbit in uh, space environment. So we'll be doing a lot of that science on the way out, and then we will hopefully reach the uh, fear of influence of the moon. All right, look at that. We've finally got some science coming in. Temperature scan done, pressure scan done. We are spinning wildly. Please don't look directly at the nav ball. We'll put that away. And as we come cruising along, we see that our batteries are getting low. How are we doing on power exposure here? Solar storm, I'm not sure if or why that would hurt or help. Panels are looking good. We're communicating, so that's getting to be a problem. Communications transmission is actually taking a ton of power. I wonder if that's trying to transmit all of this science and that's what the issue is. I feel like if that's the case, we're going to have to turn off the uh, science transmission for a minute just so that we can get there because we have 18 more hours and I cannot have this probe dying on me. All right, so what I've done is I'm going to turn actually back on the science because the nice thing is that you can actually play with a lot of this stuff. So I think what's happening is we are now using, uh, this does still have an antenna, it looks like. I thought I removed it, but it still looks like it's on here. Um, but yeah, we're using this and it's actually using a lot more power than I ex anticipated uh, because I had to crank the power, the transmit power up so that it could actually transmit back to earth. Or is this one down? Shoot, did I not? So I have two versions of this probe, one of which actually has lunar range uh, antenna that I've turned the power up on and some that don't. So this may not actually have the ability to talk to the moon. So I guess we're uh, talk to Earth from the moon. So I guess we are going to see about that. Yeah, this does not look great, but we'll see. All right, we have no signal whatsoever, so we are getting no communications from the moon. I think that's because I have, um, if we look at this, uh, this here, you can see that it says 28 dBm, and I'm pretty sure that I, when I was testing, to be able to get any connection at the lunar uh, 
altitude, it needed to be something like 34, I'm pretty sure. So I think that's my mistake on setting up this probe wrong. This is one of the ones that I was going to use for um, Earth communications. However, um, let's see, lunar flyby uncrewed. We do have to collect science from around the moon, so and we also had to be within 5,000 kilometers. So yeah, this is a completely failed mission in all respects. But just for fun, we have uh, entered the sphere of influence of the moon, and so we have our first lunar flyby. Looks fantastic. Uh, does not actually satisfy the contract in any respect. Um, I probably should have looked at that a little more closely, but it would not have mattered because with the uh, orbit that I had, I was never going to be able to get uh, any closer. So yeah, this is going to fly out of um, the lunar sphere of influence, and then it is going to fly out of Earth's sphere of influence, and then it is going to orbit the sun for the rest of its days. Uh, until the solar panels degrade and it no longer is able to keep its batteries charged. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, an, a really cool mission that has kind of taught us a lot of stuff. And we'll take that to the next variant on this one, Pioneer 2. And we'll use that to actually satisfy both of these contracts, hopefully. All right, I've warped ahead just a little bit as I was testing out um, launch windows uh, to get back to the moon. Uh, and also my lunar range communications, uh, making sure that like when I actually get there with the antenna that I've picked up, that it will work theoretically. Um, and you know, no spoilers on that one, but it, maybe it's fine, question mark. Uh, and while that was happening, I just realized I have 60 science and I have no idea where all of that science came from. I have to assume it came from my most recent, uh, our most recent satellite. So yeah, in Kerbalism, you can see all of your flights here in this little Kerbalism panel. Um, and if you click on hidden vessels, we can see all the ones that I have hidden away before. So we've got a bunch of booster stages or upper stages and then also the satellites that I've launched that have since died. Uh, and we can see that Pioneer 1 is out in orbit of the sun with, a, with power, uh, but no connection. Um, which is about what we would expect. And this was the point where I was going to triumphantly say, well, look at this. You can see in the logs that all sorts of science happened for some reason. And then it's, it's gone. Like, I guess when you close the game and come back to it, um, herbalism purges these logs or something. I don't know when exactly that happens. But what it looked like happened was somehow, some way, we got connection while we were over the moon. And we were actually able to get some science transmitted, which sounds like a bug. Like, I, I'm not sure how I would duplicate that again, but we definitely got science from around the moon and transmitted that back. Um, so we can see things like telemetry analysis. We have space high over, over the moon. So that proves that it did send back some science, even though I'm not sure that it was supposed to. Um, yeah, so I don't love that. Um, that seems like kind of a breaking bug for me. Like, I don't know if it's going to give us, like, telemetry from around the sun. We got some from a flight, but it doesn't look like we actually got any completed science back. So that's working as intended. So yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I got a little bit of that science uh, seemingly undeservedly but we definitely got some back and so that is going to be really helpful on our way to the next bit so i'll take it it's basically we got some early science uh, we have another pioneer satellite being built the pioneer 2 but until then we are going to use 60 science to unlock some nodes and also perhaps more importantly we can uh, spend some upgrades because this is where things really get interesting with uh, rp1 and Kerbal construction time where every time you get 20 science, every 20 science, like that's not a number that like escalates over time, um, you get one science, you get one upgrade point. And so getting 60 science means I've earned two additional points uh, because I probably had some fraction of the first 20 already. Uh, so yeah, that's for two free points, which is just fan fabulous. So we're going to upgrade our vehicle assembly building. Lovely, lovely. And do some uh, VAB or uh, research and development.
And now we're finally back into the uh, R&D screen to take a look at what we want to grab next. I've talked a little bit about uh, what's coming up in 1958 orbital rocketry. I'm very excited about it, so we're definitely going to move forward on that. I think the next step is we'll take maybe a short break to do, well, I think the first thing I should do before I get all excited about what order I want things in, we should like actually unlock the nodes and then go back and see like how we want to order them. Does that make sense? All right, so here is what I think the plan is going to be. We already have 1958 orbital rocketry uh, researching, so that's already locked in and that's gonna give us a bunch of upgrades that we'll wanna play with for a while. Uh, so let's also unlock 1958 solid rocket engines. That gives us some uh, surface level and vacuum configs for the Castor rocket. Um, and then finally a Baby Sergeant engine upgrade. So that makes these uh, solid rockets very, very um, intriguing. And I think that when we're starting to look at lunar orbit insertion, that that is definitely going to be the way that we want to go. Because I think that is going to be cheap, easy, reliable, etc. Uh, so that leaves us with 55 uh, science remaining. We've jumped on uh, that solid rocket engine stuff. Uh, the biggest other problem that I think we've been facing is uh, our solar panels. So I think we're going to jump on primitive solar panels, which is going to get us a larger solar panel part, which is, I think, going to be a lot cheaper than the um, procedural uh solar panel parts that we, we also have. Like to make a procedural panel the size of these is going to make them dramatically more expensive than what these are going to be, which these look like they're gonna cost about 100 funds a piece. So maybe that'll be a little bit better. Um, and that will help us get some power to our satellites early on. Uh, now we've got 39 points left and I think, uh, what I would love to do after we get those solar panels is we get little teeny tiny boosters for our upper stages and orbital maneuvering systems on the actual probes because this gives us things like a, uh, a one kilonewton thruster. So that's itty bitty, but you know, remember, we're talking about probes that weigh 18 kilograms. So this is actually plenty of thrust for something like that. So we've got a couple different engines that would be great for that and I think will be allow us to make some very interesting uh, teensy tiny uh, upper stage probes. So that is our, ooh, and also RCS technology upgrade. So that'll make them better and more efficient. Very nice. And give us access to hydrazine, which is a really, really nice propellant. Uh, so yeah, that's why I think early flight control is probably going to be next. Looks like Kerbalism has some additional science, but uh, in all my testing, I haven't figured out where you actually apply these. I assumed it was like when you attach it to a like a configure science on a probe core, but it, it, there weren't anything there. So I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll stumble upon it eventually. Uh, and finally, the last bit of uh, stuff I think we're going to do for this particular batch of science is entry, descent, and landing which is going to give us heat shields. It's going to give us a uh, dual radial engine, which could be used on a Mars lander, I guess. <laughs> According to this, that seems a little bit... Um... Yeah, the Phoenix Mars lander uh, was launched in 2007, so I'm not 100% certain what this uh, engine is doing all the way back here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to stress about it. Uh, we also will get sample return, science sample return capsules, which means we're going to start being able to do those biological uh, science experiments and then be able to return them down to Earth once again without like exploding or doing a weird like uh, bunch of little hop, suborbital hops and that sort of stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's what these are all about and I'm pretty stoked about that. So that gets us uh, all the... Now we are back on track, uh, making progress towards doing some cool stuff. All right, here we are on the pad with my new Pioneer 2 spacecraft, which uh, is a up, slightly updated version of the Pioneer 1 that I had launched just before. Uh, not a whole lot has changed, except I've tweaked the antenna to hopefully not be incorrect this time. Uh, and yeah, so that's that's most of all that I've done is I've just gone through and I've made sure all the communications are correct. 
Uh, you may also have noticed that my sound is much better. Welcome to my new headset. Uh, I have a standalone microphone coming in a couple of days, but uh, for now, this should work out just fine, hopefully. Um, so one of the things that I kept saying was that I had launched into the wrong um, transfer window, uh, or I had launched outside or in between transfer windows. So what I had done was I launched basically at about this time of day. So every 24 hours, um, the moon is going to orbit around the Earth such that it crosses its ascending or descending node uh, where the inclination, uh, the relative inclination is zero um, between uh, where the moon is in its orbit and where where you would be if you had just launched at a 90 degree angle from your launch pad. Um, and so that is the point that you're going to want to leave for the moon uh, when that is very low, when the relative inclination is low, because that makes it a dramatic amount cheaper to get to the target. Um, so one of the ways that you can figure that out is I have uh, Kerbal Engineer open with the rendezvous window. And that shows you your time to the relative uh, ascending node and descending node, and also the relative inclination. So you can see that that's kind of ticking down, and that's about when you're going to want to launch, uh, is when this, like I said, when this gets down to about zero. Um, I was trying to do it by like kind of like evening out the orbit lines and going, okay, well, I think that's about right and all that sort of thing, and that's silly. That's that's very Kerbal and not uh, <laughs> not becoming of us here in RP1. So yeah, we can use uh, we can use this to manually figure out when the launch window is going to be. Um, but you could get the same information by using PVG. And like I mentioned before, I've tweaked this a little bit to work better, even better with PVG. So hopefully this should uh, uh, this rocket should work out. That's what I've tweaked. I haven't tweaked much here. This The defaults still work if you're actually putting in the correct uh, information. Um, so what you can do is if you launch into plane of target with this button here, then it will automatically wait to launch until you are at that transfer window. And so that's a perfect way for us to just get there with no issues whatsoever. So after all that, let's uh, engage autopilot. All right, probably launch into plane of target, then engage the autopilot. And that puts us in a pre-launch status for the next 12 hours and will automatically warp us forward, which means the sun goes down and this is going to be a nighttime launch. All right, as we get a little bit closer, just a minute down, waiting until I can actually stage, because I think I need to do the first stage myself. So I will go ahead and do that. All right, we are in our terminal countdown. Ten more seconds. Eight, seven, six. I don't actually need to count all the way down. One. Kaboom. Fabulous. There we go. And we are launched, and it hasn't blown up or anything, or shut down or whatever. So yeah, uh, this should now, if we go back to our rendezvous, uh, you can see that the relative inclination is nearly zero, which, you know, that's what we're looking for. Now we're going to launch into an orbit that is uh, the same inclination as the orbit of the moon, and we know that this uh, this rocket has plenty of delta V to do that at a 250 kilometer uh, periapsis. Um, and then we are going to hopefully be able to um, get up from there and impact the moon. That is that is the plan for this one. All right, launching up into the sunrise, we can see the lovely rocket plume. Uh, I have updated uh, RP1 fairly recently, and uh, in doing so, I actually just reinstalled the whole thing from scratch because I honestly find that easier than trying to upgrade something in place and maybe accidentally break something. So one of the things that uh, changed in that uh, reinstall is we lost uh, Raider Nix probes, uh, US probes and Soviet probes, because that's no longer supported by RP-1. Uh, so yeah, I think I cut out most of the references to wanting to use those, but I really did because they are absolutely gorgeous models, and if you're just playing Realism Overhaul, I highly recommend you play with those. Um, 
but we're not going to be playing with them here. It's going to be all procedurals all the time. Another thing that I got a lot of comments on was just how atrocious that orbit was last time, and I, I get it. I 100% understand it was bad. I could have done a lot of things better, so hopefully I will be able to um, not insult your guys' intelligence by uh, getting into terrible orbits and not actually being a helpful, a helpful sort of person here, because I'd like this to be, you know, kind of educational, um, but also... We are staging, and we are we are coasting for the next couple of minutes, and hopefully we are high enough so that this doesn't spin like crazy. Yeah, it looks like we are in pretty darn good shape so far. Uh, but yeah, I want to be educational about how to play RP1. Uh, I've mentioned before that I really want to be kind of a bridge between, you know, regular Kerbal Space Program and RP-1 for uh, folks that might be intimidated. Um, and I guess the charm is that even if a doofus, if a doofus like me can make it work uh, and get and launch a probe and have it impact the moon, then you can definitely do it, too. I believe in you. But that said, that doesn't give that doesn't make any excuse for me getting into terrible orbits that are not actually useful and wasting everybody's time. So I will be avoiding that as much as I possibly can. Um, there's a lot of things that I just don't know, so I will be going into a lot of things blind and trying to figure them out myself. But uh, that and that will happen sometimes on camera. But sometimes I will work out these orbits off camera. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, the antenna is extended, and we can see that it is now the proper 34 dBm uh, power-hungry uh, power hungry antenna that it is. And we are coming around, and uh, I don't have an antenna on the probe, and I do on the avionics. So yeah, that's all about what I intended it to be. So yeah, we have another almost two minutes of coasting, so we will get to that. All right, looks like our AJ-1037 has done it for us this time. It has ignited, and we are boosting our way into a good orbit. Um, looks like MechJeb has good plans for us. We should be able to get into a nice, stable orbit and then be able to uh, have plenty of propellant left over as, uh, as buffer. Um, so we will get into the orbit that we asked for. Lovely, lovely. And then from there, we will be boosting on towards the moon. And because we are going to be boosting into the orbit of the moon, so you can see now that we're just in the same orbit, which just makes my life so much easier. Trying to like match, trying to intercept from two uh, orbits that are inclined by more than 30 degrees uh, in uh, re relative to each other is just not, it's not fun. And that's why that orbit, uh, that's why my flyby wound up being such a distant flyby. Um, and why it wound up uh, very accurately, not accurately, but it uh, approximated Pioneer, the early Pioneer missions so well because, you know, they just didn't, didn't quite make it uh, out there. Uh, there were a lot of failures in this early part. But hopefully we should be able to get this up to the correct, um, the cor correct trajectory and the uh, maneuver to get to the moon will be a lot easier. Uh, one last thing I want to mention that I've changed is I've increased the UI size on MechJeb. So that means I have to move things around all the time because uh, for some reason a lot of the interface objects will stay in the same place uh, in different scenes, which I don't love, but is what it is. I'd rather have the larger UI for everybody uh, so you can see better. And there we are. We have a lovely, just perfect orbit at 250 kilometers, inclined at 28 degrees uh, at the exact same inclination as the moon. So we are ready to rock. So that means we can just like at our leisure, uh, once I actually have control, I can make a maneuver node to get us to the moon, and hopefully we will have control sooner rather than later. Uh, I really can't have that ComNet satellite up soon enough, I'll tell you. There we go. We finally have a connection. That takes far too long. Um, I'm not sure what the early game solution is to that, but uh, is what it is for now. Um, one unfortunate thing is that means that I'm not sure that I'm in the right place for this maneuver. So I guess we're just going to see. 
Nah, this should be fine. I'm not stressed about that at all. All right, so we are just gonna move it on in. Uh, one thing I forgot to do was install a better maneuver node editor. Yeah, I don't hate the one that MechJab has attached, so let's try this one. I don't think I've used this one before, but it's fairly similar to uh, the one that I'm used to, which is Precise Node. All right, so we are about a minute away from the beginning of the burn of this uh, maneuver that is going to get us to the moon, and it's a little bit of a wonky one because uh, I don't have enough electric charge to make a full orbit around the Earth before uh, starting this burn because I want to get rid of the power-hungry avionics that we have on here. So what we are going to do, um, I think... Close that, open this, go ahead and get us pointed nodeward, and then we are going to uh, impart a bit of spin, and then we will be off. All right, nice and dead center, so we'll turn this off and begin our spin. And also start firing the thrusters outward, and away we go! All right, so... Uh, we have, like I said, this is a little bit of a wonky burn uh, because I wanted to make sure that we didn't have to go too far around the moon, but we did have tons of extra Delta V, so we had plenty to play with to hopefully make this uh, impact work. So we are going to see how that goes, and I just need to very precisely cut this maneuver off when we get uh, get to the end of it. Because uh, I'm not sure that we have a ton of um, of leeway on either side uh, for this burn to go out of control. So I am ready on the key. And... There we go. How's that look? Did we do it? I think we did. That should impact the moon. Fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, we are not using Principia because that sounded a little bit terrifying, to be perfectly honest. Um, I have a hard enough time with just regular patched conics. Um, having unstable orbit sounds like kind of a lot. Um, maybe next time. So I am aware that there is a um, Execute Next Node ability for MechJab, but when I've used it on this, it hasn't been able to figure out how to ullage and... Uh, then separate. Um, there's a little too much user uh, input needed for that to for that to work cleanly. Uh, maybe there's a way for that to work, but I wasn't able to figure it out. Uh, so, anyways, the other thing that I was told is a lovely thing that is possible. Uh, let's go ahead and kill this probe first of all. I don't need to know about the upper stage before it burns up. Uh, is automation. So there's automation on the uh, devices on here. Devices power low. Yeah, so this is the automation screen that I'm used to showing. Uh, this is the one that is uh, all of our science and waiting for situations and all that sort of thing. And uh, But there's more windows. Like, there's more tabs here that allow you to really uh, very carefully, <laughs> as you can see, choose how your uh, your vessel will operate without your input because it is running all the time in the background. So uh, these are like each one of these will allow you to turn on and turn off various things when power gets low. And that way you can save the power. And so we remember that the data transmission was the biggest power problem that we had when we sent this out the first time. So what we can do is when power goes low, we can turn off data transmission, and then when power is high, we turn it back on. There you go. And that way, it should, in theory, be able to automatically keep gathering science the whole time, uh, and then, but then turn off the data transmission uh, of science back um, when the power is low until it recharges. Yeah, so that's all there is to that. Um, this looks like it's going to be a good impact. I don't think there's anything that is going to throw me off at this point. Fingers crossed, famous last words, etc., etc. But yeah, we are off, and let's let's talk again when we get a, the moon encounter. All right, so you can see now that uh, 
the power has turned off. Oop. Po yep, the power has turned back on and the automation has turned it. Yep, there's a communication and then the communication stops. So that is going to dramatically slow the progress of any science that we get. But it does mean that we have power as we are now about to get into our encounter with the moon. And there we go. We have it now, friends. We are almost there. Uh, in just six hours time, we should impact the moon. There you are, friend. You're all in darkness, and that's unfortunate, but I'm going to punch you right in the face. All right. So, yeah, we only have two hours of possible uh, battery life on here. So we need to manage this a little bit carefully. Um, what I think might be a good idea at this point is to turn off our automation and manage this manually for now because we are running two science experiments, which is lovely, but I am going to just turn off our data transmission for now so that we can keep a good charge because this is going to cost us a lot and we need to get moon science on the way in. So let's actually take a look at our contracts here. So we need to get within 5,000 kilometers and we need to impact the moon at least 2,450 meters per second, which I think is all good. Uh, we must have power when that happens. Um, so that seems important. But yeah, we've already collected science, so we are actually all good, but I still want to make sure that I get as much science as possible. So we are going to charge it up. All right, and I realized that I was, because we don't actually have the contract stipulation to get more science, I don't feel any particular need to micromanage this, um, even though I just got done saying that I would. Uh, so yeah, I've turned the automation back on to what we had before, and it is going to try its best to get this science back. You see it has uh, Earth space high, Moon space high uh, science to send back. So let's, uh, shoot, let's focus on the Moon space um science as we get in. All right, so we are descending. We are sending back science. We are acquiring science. And there's the shutoff and the recharge. So as we get a little closer, okay, it's time now to once again intervene to enable data transmission and turn off uh, the automation. And uh, yeah, we are going to, yep, there we go. Uh, because we are going to just be crashing into the moon here any second now. So yeah, there you go. It's not uh, not much to look at. It's a little ominous uh, if you turn your brightness up a little bit, I guess. But um, yeah, we are heading towards the moon at incredible velocity. Just a little bit longer, half an hour now until impact time. And we have completed the contract for the lunar flyby for 150,000 funds and 60 reputation. We are now 10 minutes away from impacting into the dark side of the moon. Man, I'm really bummed that this is not anything to look at. Whoa. Spun the camera around pretty dramatically there. All right, we are coming down in just 50 seconds, and we are sending up as much science as we can, frantically returning the science that we get as we approach the lunar surface. That's something that uh, they did as well on a lot of the, like the Ranger uh, probes, uh, like the actual first U.S. lunar impactors, for example, they were sending back science until the very last second, trying just gleaning all sorts of interesting data right into the last minute. Oh, it's actually a little spooky that I can't tell where the moon actually is. I'm pretty sure it's this big dark spot down here, but the fact that we just can't see it, but we are 10 seconds above the surface, our uh, altitude is reducing dramatically. Or... Three, two, one. Kaboom! We have impacted the moon. 
All right, my friends, we have done it. Congratulations on hitting the moon. We're getting some great data here. So that got us 187,000 more funds, 15 science, 90 reputation. Fantastic. I love it. Oh my gosh. I don't think I realized this, but um, dipping back into the uh, contracts menu, you can do that again. <laughs> So we can do another flyby. Uh, you can complete this up to twice. Uh, and you can do an impactor up to three times. And you get the same gigantic reward each time. Oh my gosh, I don't know why we would do anything else except for just just keep chucking probes at the moon until we've won. <laughs> or at least gotten enough uh, funds and science to really get us moving a little bit forward. Um, that trajectory obviously is not good for actually gathering science. Um, we were able to transmit some, but um, screaming into the sphere of influence and into the surface of the moon at uh, 3,000 or more than 3,000 meters per second relative to the lunar surface is uh, not conducive to long-term studies. But we do get the 15 from just accomplishing the contract and more than 300 and... And 337,000 funds to boot each time we do that combo. So we're going to do that a couple more times. That's just wonderful. And yeah, looking at this, you can also do the lunar orbit twice, which is fantastic. And they've... Oh gosh. This is kind of fun. Uh, there's also an uncrewed lunar landing contract that has just uh, unlocked because I've proven our ability to get to the moon, period. Um, you can do it five times for a huge payout. Um, but it looks like you can't do this and a crude lunar landing at the same time. I'm not sure if that means, I'm not sure if that means that you can't do both period or if you just can't do both at the same time, because that would make perfect sense that you can't do them both at the same time, because if they allowed you to do both, like have both contracts, then a crude pod, like once you got out of it, that would count as landed on the moon and transmitting uh, science probably which would not be conducive to good gameplay. Oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense. So to unlock the um, first human moon landing contract, you have to have done a lunar landing uncrewed. So you have to do this first. And you also have to have an orbital flight crewed. So yeah, they actually mandate like the progression of the Apollo missions where you have to do like a, uh, you have to do your Apollo 8 before you can get your Apollo 11, which makes perfect sense to me. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a little ways off, I think, but I'm really excited to get there. And with 350,000 funds, I think we are much closer than we were a moment before. All right, so one thing that I would like to do before we... Uh, before I start spending this on part unlocks and upgrades and new tooling and stuff, is I think it's time to start working on our next size launch pad. So we've had a lot of fun with the Thor Able, and I have a lot of missions that I think we can get out of that, but we need to start thinking for the future. To really do a lot more work in orbit, uh, both around Earth and the moon, we need heavier launch vehicles, and that means we need to unlock a 150 ton launch pad. So what we are going to do is I'm going to click on this and we're going to call this Complex 150 to go with my uh, continued naming of them after just the size that they are, which makes sense to me. Uh, that's going to cost us 150,000 funds and take us more than a year. So like I said, we want to get that started now before we really start thinking about the rest of the technology because that's, that's obviously a foundational piece. All right, one thing I'd like to do to upgrade our Celis 2 rocket is to get the avionics uh, up to snuff. I don't see any reason not to make that happen. Um, so what that's going to do for us is that's going to let us make that bigger. We're going to have to retool it, but we were going to have to retool this anyways uh, if we wanted to upgrade it. So the size is not, not, a, not something that matters. All right, so we're looking for 57 tons on this, and then we'll go ahead and resize the utilization, which gets us down to 59.9, and the smallest size that we can possibly get this. Would be nice. Same thing up here. I would like to configure 
both open there. Uh, switch this one also to early avionics. Uh, this is going to be a much more impactful one because that's going to reduce the power requirements of the of this upper stage set of avionics, which uh, you know really is going to help a lot with um, making sure that we can nail our launch windows by having more time in orbit. All right, so that being that, let's go ahead and tool our avionics. That doesn't cost all that much. Avionics, there we go. And there we go. That's just a slight upgrade to the Celis 2 rocket that is going to make it more usable going forward. All right, so the last big one I think we're going to spend this set of funds on is we want the 1.25 meter cockpit, which allows for suborbital flight. So that is going to allow us to break the Kármán line, uh, you know, once I hire a new set of astronauts. But um, yeah, so we definitely want that. And I think we're also going to want the B-9 procedural wing space plane variant so that they can handle um, the stresses of re-entry. And another 30,000 on that. And here is another trick. So you notice I uh, spent 30,000 on the B9 procedural wing space plane, but these remained at the same price. But there's like no entry cost here on, on this part. See, there would be one here, but there's not now. That's because when we click out and back in, they're now free because there's an entry cost modifier for uh, parts. When you buy related parts, this is the same issue that made the. Um, this is the same issue that made the LR-105 and LR-89 look really expensive, even though I had bought the LR-79, and you get a giant part discount for buying one of them uh, that applies to the rest. And the same thing works for like the RD, uh, RDXXX series, is, um, all have that same kind of uh, inter-family discount. So uh, that gets us that, and that makes it a lot less expensive than I thought it was, which makes it a lot less scary to jump into. We'll buy this Attitude Jet. That sounds pretty exciting. Not sure I need a Ram Jet or any of these static parts. Get a cargo bay. That might be fun. And air launch level four. Yeah, so that is going to let us build new X-Planes. All right, so we do need to hire ourselves a new pilot. So Johnny Flores, I think you are the one. Uh, you are highly courageous and also highly stupid, which is... Um, you know, again, one of those things that doesn't make a ton of sense in RP1, but, you know, we're going to go with it. Um, I just like the name Johnny Flores. That sounds like an X-15 pilot. Like, there was only one uh, John in the X-15 test pilot class, uh, John McKay. But Johnny Flores sounds like the kind of person who would jump into a rocket plane and shoot and go tearing out of Earth's atmosphere, right? We are going to enlist this Kerbal for 50,000 funds. Um, he is going to hang out with us for seven years, no earlier than. And one thing that I just wanted to kind of bring up here as like an expectation setting, um, it's not entirely likely that this pilot will stick with us until we have our Mercury capsule. Um, it's not actually super intended that you keep your first class of pilots all the way from uh, the beginning of the game until you, you know, get to capsules. Like, you're expected to actually go through a couple classes, uh, just like NASA did, just like the actual space program did. Like, so you had your Chuck Yeager flying your X-1, um, uh, but then you had a different class that flew the X-15, and then you had a different class that was flying in a mercury capsule, that sort of thing. So it's not unexpected that my, that first class all retired. But we are just going to hire the one because we just need the one to uh, knock out a couple of X-Plane contracts. Um, it's good to have someone back that is able to do those. Uh, and yeah, now I'm going to have to build myself an X-15, for goodness sake. All right, small... Uh, drawback on my plan to um, make an X-15 is the XLR-99 engine that I would need to make one like kind of historically accurate is way out here in 1959 orbital rocketry. Uh, it is currently 1960. It is February and we are behind on research, we're going to say. Uh, we are a couple nodes back, um, which, you know, like I said, it's not actually that big of a deal to be 
behind on the research. Uh, the more important thing is the gameplay and the way that this feels for everybody. Uh, so I'm not going to stress about like, oh no, I'm woefully far behind. But you know, it is something that we would like to catch up on. We would like to catch up on the real world uh, technology. Uh, but that does make it a little difficult to make something that matches the um, performance characteristics of the X-15 if I don't have the engines to do it. I would have to you know, slap something else together, which I might do, I might play around with, but I think for now, for now, I think we can very simply, and see if I'm wrong about this, just swap in the uh, 1.25 meter cockpit for the X-1 cockpit. Let's see how that feels. There we go, that looks a little strange, but I think that's actually fine. That mostly conforms to the line that was being done by this uh, this nose cone here. And I don't think it reduces our, um, I think this keeps it pretty, pretty sleek, and so this should work, should work, I think. And we can do a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the same things that we've been doing before, like turning down the antenna, because this is not going to go very far out of Earth's atmosphere, if uh, even though it is going out of Earth's atmosphere. You can see it has air pump, scrubber, and O2 pressure controller. That's Kerbalism's life support. Your suit life support. Kind of neat. Lasts for eight hours. Well, that's fine. We're not going to be out on that long. Aha! Crew science. Yeah, so this is what I think I've been wondering about. All right, it says configure crew science, but I'm not actually able to configure. I'm not actually able to change anything on here. So I think that that's the uh, all the experiments that we'll be gaining is going to be something that we get here later on. The heavy cockpit. Wow. Heavy, expensive, and not toolable in any way. That's just what the cost is. Holy crap. Yeah, this cost, this cockpit by itself is 3,000 funds. That's bonkers, and I'm actually really curious if that's just what it's like at this at uh, at this level. Like, are all uh, capsules going to be that ridiculous ridiculously expensive? Because the Kana cockpit was 300 funds. These other cockpits are like 20 and 30. So yeah, uh, don't blow up this cockpit. Holy crap! Like we we're gonna want to build exactly one of these. I think is the answer to that. And that only gives us six percent credit towards the. Uh, um, the original build. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the X3 as it was uh, so that we can fly some early missions um, just to get uh, our new pilot up to speed. And then I will build a brand new plane that's a little bit extended, I think, with better engines because we have a couple extra conf configs that we could use. Um, yeah, and I think that's how we are going to get, get back into the uh, X-plane game. So because Johnny Flores is brand new, uh, he needs to take 45 days to um, take a course in X1 proficiency. So we're going to go ahead and get that on the clock, uh, which is good. That gives us time to, you know, work on some other stuff uh, while we're while he's spinning up. All right. So I have made an abomination and stretched out CMOV's X1 uh, XLR11 uh rocket plane. Uh, I've attached the 1.25 meter cockpit. I've adjusted the parachute. I've upgraded the engines. I've given it a whole bunch more fuel uh, to hopefully be able to do um, a better impression of an X-15 before I actually have that technology. Uh, so yeah, we'll see if this actually works. Um, it would be really cool if it did. I think it should at least be able to jump out of the atmosphere. Like the, I'm pretty sure the X3 cyplane that we already have, based on CMOV's work, can already do that. Um, but it would, you know, kill the pilot. <laughs> uh, so performance is not what I'm super worried about. But I did want the uh, option to upgrade this a little bit and see if maybe it wouldn't kill anybody. So I guess we'll see about that. But it is going to take a very long time unless I start dumping in some points into the uh, space plane hangar, which um, I may want to do, like just for because I've been doing so much out of here. But we are going to get this on the uh, uh, get this going. We have an X3 side plane already in the hangar and ready to go so we can work on that as Johnny Flores's first launch. All right, so he has proficiency with the X1. Fabulous. So now it's time for mission training on the X1. 
for you, sir. It's going to take you two weeks, which is very handy because that's about how long it's going to take to prep this for air launch. But all right, so now we have a little bit of extra funds. So let's go ahead and spend 2,000. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, two extra points, which gets us three between that and the science that we have received. Uh, so we can do, I think we really want to get the R&D moving, so one, two points there, and one in our space plane hangar, because we do indeed need to get that moving. But now that we've done that, we it's like the next couple of missions uh, to send stuff out to the moon is going to be almost pure profit. We've got a Pioneer 2 uh, in progress as well. It's literally a duplicate of the last one we sent up, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so yeah, lots of cool stuff coming. So that should get us a lot more extra funds uh, and science for doing another flyby and impact. And then we're also going to be running our, we've got our Cyplane program ready to start back up. Uh, and then once we have all of those moving, we are then going to be able to start uh, putting our funds towards um, other large improvements. Uh, one thing that we really need to start thinking about is when we want to upgrade our R&D facility. So we have a um, we have a, a new heavier launch pad building now, which is going to get us the ability to make the next class of, of uh, rocket, which is going to get us uh, lunar orbiters at the very least. Um, but to move forward in science, we are bottlenecked at this point here. So this line at 1960 is the cutoff uh, before we start getting technology that is not, um, we are not going to be able to move past uh, because of the R&D size. So uh, the first level R&D is not going to be able to research anything t uh, over 25 science. So we are going to be able to get early human spaceflight materials and early human spaceflight electronics, both of which are blue sky nodes that give us nothing. Um, but then all of the actual technology that comes after that is going to require us to get the next level of research and development facility, which is going to cost us 500,000 funds. So we need to make sure that we are um, taking some of this... Uh, lunar contract money and putting it towards that. We are entering an incredibly exciting time. We've got our first couple of moon missions under our belt. We have impacted the moon and that also counted as a lunar flyby. Uh, we have a brand new test pilot who is ramping up on a modified X-1 and will be uh, flying our first X-15. He'll be the first pilot to break the Kármán line and enter space. We've got a ton of uh, lunar contracts that are lined up from more impacts, flybys, orbits, uh, all ready for us to uh, get to with the rockets that we have. And we have a new pad building and all kinds of stuff. So we are just entering the most exciting part of our playthrough yet. And I'm super excited to get to it, but that is obviously gonna do it for us for this week. So if you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you guys thought, and I will see you next time.